Thank you. Could I please ask those in the public gallery who are leaving the chamber to please do so quickly and quietly as we are now continuing our business with our next item of business and that is the members business debate on motion 11396 in I haven't yet finished Mr Kerr in the intro so I will call you when I've done my bit thank you in the name of Stephen Kerr on the future of Grangemouth oil refinery this debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons. I would just advise members, of course, that we are resuming at 2 o'clock this afternoon for our further business. And therefore, I would encourage members, please, to stick to their allocated speaking time. I appreciate there's a lot of interest and important debate, but we do have to allow time for the staff to help to clear the chamber. And with that, I call Mr Stephen Kerr. I uh, apologise, uh, Deputy Plenos, for the false start. Um, members will be aware of the shock, worry and frustration in the Grangemouth area following November's announcement on the future of Grangemouth refinery. And I just want to put my cards on the table. I want to see the life of this refinery, which is actually one of the jewels in central Scotland's economic crown, extended. So I'm going to use this member's business debate to ask the minister some specific questions which deserve her considered response. Of course, the global dynamics of oil and gas production have undergone seismic shifts, with production waning in Europe while surging in the US, China, West Africa and the Middle East. Grangemouth was built in 1924, and I acknowledge it now needs substantial investment to remain viable. Petro Ineos is looking into alternatives for the site, including an enlarged import terminal. Their deadline of spring 2025 for final decisions is little over a year away. I believe that government has a role to play in ensuring a successful future for this key part of our economy. The devolution settlement resulted in a complex intertwining of energy and net zero, meaning both governments have to work together for the sake of Grangemouth. And I want to hear an assurance. Yeah, happy to give way to Daniel Johnson. Daniel Johnson. Uh, for giving way. I just wonder if he might reflect on two points. First of all, while he's right about the investment required, this is still a profitable site, both according to INEOS and the trade unions, and I think that's worth reflecting on. Secondly, I wonder if he'd reflect on the fact that the global context includes a situation where the US, they've already got a committed price for things like sustainable aviation fuel, and, and we don't have that from the UK government. Stephen Kerr. Daniel Johnson, thank him for his intervention. He preempts some of the issues that I'm going to come on to in my speech. But I am going to make a serious point, and this is not a party political point, even though it may feel like one. I want to hear an assurance from the Minister that we aren't going to get into constitutional games playing on the future of the refinery's future. And I give way to the Minister. Uh, Minister Julian I Martin. just simply want to say you have my absolute assurance on that both governments have to work together for the sake of the future of the site. Stephen Kerr. And I, and I thank the Minister for that response. Um, both governments must set aside whatever differences there are and embark on the task of craft, crafting a comprehensive strategy which addresses two pivotal aspects. One is energy resilience for Scotland and the future of Grangemouth and the surrounding communities. A dialogue must be initiated, I think it may already have been initiated with Petro Ineos, to unravel the true reasons behind their decision to close the refinery. Is it a joint decision involving both sides of the joint venture or does it stem from factors beyond economic trends? So, Deputy Presiding Officer, a key piece of work in extending the life of the refinery would be to reinstate the hydrocracker line, which has been inactive since April. Now, Daniel Johnson mentioned profitability. The hydrocracker unit is critical to the profit streams for the refinery. Now, I'm not going to pretend to be an engineer, and I don't understand the processes, but what I do get is that the hydrocracker is the critical unit 
which produces diesel and jet fuel, yep. two big, if not the biggest, profit generators for the refinery. And that hydrocracker unit has not been working for a very long time. And getting it back online is critical to keeping the refinery going. So I asked the Minister, what is the latest Petro Ineos have told her about the hydrocracker? When will it be up and running? And what are the issues preventing it from being restarted? Now, the Grangemouth Future Industry Board was set up with worthy intentions, but it is stacked with public sector bodies and there is no private sector involvement. They meet infrequently, and the last meeting only lasted for an hour. So can the Minister spell out what the Grangemouth Future Industry Board is going to deliver? What specific task does it have? What are the deadlines? How exactly does it protect the future of the refinery? Now, the workers absolutely need to be involved. Their voices need to be heard at every level, and local people, and Falkirk Council all need to know what it is that the Grangemouth Future Industry Board is going to do. Because that board, or a functional replacement, must get to grips with the sustainable future that's required for Grangemouth. Now, a good template for this strategy would be the UK 2070 Commission's Teesside Task Force paper, working with businesses and universities. This is an example of how different bodies, public and private, can come together to address the kind of challenges that are now being faced by Grangemouth. So what discussions has the Minister had with our UK ministerial colleagues on sustainable aviation fuels and a biofuel future for Grangemouth? And a key question, what are the regulatory barriers that exist to switch to biofuels? And can the Minister reassure me that these barriers can be dealt with and won't put off potential investors? My preference, as I said, is for the plant to remain operational. But if, after all avenues have been thoroughly investigated, that cannot be achieved, and if Petro Ineos are still not willing to put in investment or some other private investor is not willing to put in the investment to keep Scotland's only refinery operating, we need to be ready with the right plan. And we need to know the scale of the challenge we will face. And that means we need a comprehensive economic impact assessment completed as soon as possible. We need to know the scale of what it is we're dealing with. So this comprehensive economic impact assessment must, must look at the detail in terms of jobs, GDP, the, the impact on council tax revenue, national GDP, employment, and other considerations, and again, the voices of workers must be heard. What timescale would... Colleague yes, of course. Brian Hussle. I'm very grateful to Stephen Kerr for um, his analysis of, of what's required. Does, does he also recognise that currently this, the, the impact on the supply chain is yet to be established, and that is, is, is at least as important as, as, as what's what, what, the, what he's uh, detailing there just now? Stephen Kerr. Oh, absolutely, and that's why we need the comprehensive economic impact assessment. It is a vital piece of work. Mm -hmm. So what timescale would the Minister consider practical for the delivery of an economic impact assessment? When will it be completed and published? Now, the term just transition is bandied about a lot in this Parliament. But I know from my conversations with representatives of the workforce that those, that term it actually provides cold comfort to most workers. Yes, some jobs will be delivered fairly quickly. Some already have been. But the risk of highly skilled, highly paid workers losing their jobs, leaving the area, that is a devastating prospect for the local economy and indeed, I think, for Scotland's economy. But we must be honest and acknowledge that anything resembling a full just transition away from fossil fuels is going to take decades. So the Grangemouth just transition right now for the workforce in that community feels like a blunt injustice. Mm -hmm. The Grangemouth Refinery is not merely an industrial facility. It is the beating heart of Grangemouth and the surrounding communities. And I implore both governments to do all they can together to keep the Grangemouth Refinery open, including giving serious consideration to government 
backed investment. And finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, let us in this place put aside political colours and favours yeah. and work together as we should to ensure that the lights of Grangemouth continue to burn brightly. Thank you, Mr Kerr. I would remind all members who are seeking to speak in the debate to please check that they have pressed the request to speak button. And I would also uh, remind members that it's backbench speeches of up to four minutes. And with that, I call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Ms Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to speak in this important uh, debate today, and I thank Stephen Kerr for his reflective comments. And let, let's hope that this debate continues to bring more light than heat. I'm a ferocious protector of my constituency of Falkirk East, including Grangemouth, and I'd like to reflect that the Grangemouth community is quite remarkable in its resilience, and they deserve praise for the pragmatic way in which they've sought to play their part in shaping their future. This can only be a worrying time for the workers too, and I commend the effort of the unions involved thus far. Grangemouth is indeed the beating heart of both an industrial past and a greener future. Those that describe the refinery as a national strategic asset are right. Those that have concerns about energy security are absolutely right. Those that say we must do all we can to retain it as an oil refinery are not wrong, but my focus must be on we must do all that we can to ensure the entire industrial cluster around Grangemouth continues to thrive both now and for the future. So what do my asks look like? Firstly, I was pleased that Graeme Stewart MP, Minister of State for Energy Security and Net Zero in the UK Government, indicated his willingness to look at all options for the refinery. And we wait to hear what more support they'll offer. And it may be that the Minister can give more insight on discussions thus far today. And I know the UK Government will offer financial support to strategically important industrial commercial ventures who are loss-making. And I draw attention to the UK Government grant of up to £500 million for the Port Talbot site run by Tata Steel UK. Yes, uh -huh. Stephen Kerr. Can I pay tribute to Michelle Thompson for the work I know that she's doing uh, to support the community that is her constituency? But would she agree with me that the economic impact assessment would be a cold shower for all of us. If we realise what the impact of losing the refinery would be with no replacement, no continuity. And so that work, in a sense, would allow us to see proportionally what it is that government needs to do and what that might look like in relation to the costs that might arise because of the closure of the refinery. Misha Thompson. I absolutely agree, and I too will reflect on that in my speech. Another barrier I have highlighted previously is around enabling the site to be modified to become a biorefinery and to use the likes of sustainable aviation fuel. And I know this is something that Graeme Simpson pressed Graeme Stewart hard on at a previous visit to the Economy Committee. And I agree with Mr Simpson that it cannot be right of the eight potential sites considered thus far, none of them are in Scotland. Any measures will require a pause in starting the work to convert the refinery to an import facility. And I call on Petroinus to extend their time scales to allow us all to reach a positive outcome. Petroinus has a moral duty to Grangemouth and that vital cluster that surrounds it. I know the Scottish Government and their partner agencies are con undertaking considerable work and indeed, as has already been mentioned, mapping current supply chains, we not only get a proper impact assessment for today, we also gain a much deeper understanding of what economic policy measures can be taken for tomorrow. So proactively enabling supply chains is a fundamental part of enabling a just transition. Skills too are an important part of developing our target operating model, and although I realise it, it belongs in another brief, maybe the Minister can give more information on work underway in both of these areas. Finally, whilst I was on the Economy Committee, we raised questions about the purpose, governance and membership of the Grangemouth Future Industry Board. I'd be interested in hearing the further thoughts from the Minister about how she sees this vital body uh, developing. Grangemouth is 
absolutely fundamental. And I want to put on my record my disappointment at the about turn from the potential next Prime Minister Keir Starmer. The latest announcement to drop the £20 billion energy fund had contained vital promises for Scotland. These included £1 billion to modernise Grangemouth and the suggestion of around 50,000 clean power jobs. Now, obviously, this has an immediate impact, but the vital mood music that the UK is serious in attracting global investment is severely lacking. And to that end, I encourage a very clear proposition from the Scottish Government about our ambitions, and I'm sure the Minister will have reflections on that. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Thompson. I call Graham Simpson to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Mr Simpson. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, and can I start by uh, thanking uh, Stephen Kerr for bringing this debate uh, to the Chamber, uh, and I welcome the, the tone of the, the debate so, so far. Um, I was also uh, disappointed to hear the announcement by Petro Ineos uh, last year. I, like Stephen Kerr, would you know, like the refinery to continue. If there's any way to, to achieve that, then uh, we should do it. And Stephen Kerr is absolutely right that um, this, should, this needs to involve both governments. Um, um, the UK government certainly has a very strong role to play, um, but so does the Scottish government. I think they need to work together. Um, Michelle Thompson, who I was um, uh, privileged to be a member of the Economy Committee with, and uh, she uh, refers to our, um, we'd, well, actually we did a report uh, on the just transition for the Grangemouth area, uh, contained a number of recommendations. Uh, one of which was around the Grangemouth Future Industry Board, which has uh, already been mentioned. Um, you know, we, I, I, I think it's fair to say we as a committee were very frustrated uh, that there was no private sector involvement in that board, and we found it, frankly, rather secretive. In fact, uh, in the words of the committee report, the committee calls for more clarity on the role and purpose of GFIB and what it is intended to achieve. Now, um, when I was on that uh, committee, I repeatedly mentioned uh, the role of a sustainable aviation fuel, repeated, probably at every meeting, um, uh, and, and probably, frankly, bored the pants of uh, other, other members who, at that point, probably didn't know what I was on about, uh, but Eventually they did. Now everybody's mentioning SAF, and I think SAF um, could could actually uh, provide a, a future for for Grangemouth or part of the future. Because my frustration, as Michelle Thompson has already said, uh, is that Grangemouth was not not one of the um, places uh, earmarked to produce <coughs> SAF, um, and I think you know frankly there should be somewhere in Scotland making it. There is nowhere at the moment. Um, we, we did come up uh, with a recommendation uh, which said that you know, th there needs to be legislation for a price support mechanism for SAF to accompany the mandate which may be required to incentivise private sector investment uh, in, the, in the UK and Scotland. In other words, we need government Frankly, the UK government, in, in this case, needs to create a market for SAF. And I did give Graham Stewart quite a grilling when he uh, appeared before the committee. Um, rightly so, that's my job. Um, you know, so um, the UK government really needs to do that because we need to create the market for SAF. Um, we need to be looking uh, not just at SAF, but at hydrogen as well. Um, I think there are opportunities there. So I'm not completely downcast about Grangemouth. I'm disappointed uh, that, that with the announcement that, that was made, but it can have a strong future. And just to close, presiding officer, um, nobody has yet mentioned the Grangemouth flood protection scheme, and I think that's really, really, really important for the, the wider economy. Uh, Michelle Thompson and others know that I've uh, recently written to Mary McCallan um, about this. She's responded to me uh, and uh, I've shared her response with others. She has committed to set up a task force. Um, well, 
Well, Mr. Lumsden is groaning, but I think, I think um, if he sees the, the tone of the letter, which I'm happy to share with him, it was quite positive. Um, so I th I, you know, I'd like to see that task force set up. Uh, but, and, and I actually want to see the UK government involved as well because that scheme needs to go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Simpson. I now call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Mr Johnson. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank uh, Stephen Kerr for securing time to speak about this important topic? Indeed, I think he set out uh, the, the basis for, for today's debate incredibly well. This is about investment. It's about energy resilience and therefore the future of our economy and about ensuring that we actually genuinely have a just transition, not a chaotic end to key elements of our economy. And I think subsequent to that, both Michelle Thompson and Graham Simpson, I think, set out, I think, some uh, uh, very important points that flow from that. You know, if we're going to have a just transition, we need to retain the critical skills that we have and the critical skills we undoubtedly have at Grangemouth and we need to be looking at what our future energy requirements will be including things like SAF. But I'd also just like to reflect a little bit on the workforce. I, I've uh, met with them twice uh, since the announcement, both once before Christmas and one thanks to uh, the, the uh, drop-in uh, that was organised by my friend uh, Richard Leonard. And I think what has struck me is their composure focus and seriousness at a time that I think many of us would just be outraged and angry because this is a profitable site. These are highly skilled people, people that thought that they were being trained for a future, one that would enable them to learn skills and therefore provide opportunities for themselves and for their families. And they're seeing that potentially in jeopardy. Very happy to go. Minister. Minister. I, I just want to reflect on what Dan Johnson is saying. I certainly get the impression, having spoken to the unions, that the workforce actually hold the key and the answers to the future of that in terms of the ideas that they have around how their skills can be deployed, particularly in the area of becoming a biorefinery. Dan Johnson. It, it, exactly so. And I think it is really important we retain those skills. And, and I pay tribute to their, their focus and their commitment to ensuring that there is a viable site at Grangemouth. And, and let's make no mistake, this is an incredibly important site. There are only six large refineries in the entirety of the UK. This will actually see a major loss of capacity. I think we also need to reflect on not just the fact that this is important for future requirements, such as uh, uh, bio-refining or the production of SAF, and I think these are important elements. But we have to remember that actually not all uh, refined products are for fuel. Uh, as much as 50% of every barrel of oil leads to products that are actually not about fuel, about things like pharmaceuticals, dyes, plastics, other products that, yes, we may be seeking to reduce our reliance on, but these are going to be uh, 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 products that we should, will be relying on long after we hopefully stop burning oil. You know, oil is an important product, and refining is going to be an incredibly important part of that process. But I think we do all need to reflect on what has happened here, because Ineos has had essentially made a decision based on cost that this is profitable, but not as profitable as other sites and I think we need to ask why they've made this decision although I think there is still it's fair to say a large degree of confusion as to precisely these factors but it's not just about pure profitability it's also about stability and I think we do need a plan and I think that's been a I think a theme across a number of oh very happy to give Michelle Thompson. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving way it, it does seem slightly ironic to me and I, I wonder if he agrees that um, the even with, if they decided ultimately to move to an import facility, they're still dealing in the same market. And that does make me question what's going on, because it's the market itself. That's not going anywhere. And I even do question the need for or the talk of around spring 2025. I wonder what his thoughts are. I, I, Daniel Johnson? I'd agree with that. I think we need greater clarity. And I, I don't want to cast aspersions. I think that the workforce are very clear about that. But I think if we could understand... The, the basis for the decision, we could provide help. But I, just in conclusion, I think we do need a plan. And other countries have price commitments around things like SAF that is enabling investment. Likewise, we need stability around the regime that, that surrounds uh, uh, this area. I think changes in policy from governments and indeed potentially future governments 
don't help. We need consistency and stability so that, that, that businesses can make uh, confident uh, in investments. And can I finally say, uh, I'm grateful for this parliamentary time because previously we've had one urgent question and I note there's a statement, but this is a topic that needs parliamentary time to discuss these matters. I thank uh, you very much. Thank you, Mr Johnson. I now call Gillian Mackay to be followed by Stephanie Callaghan. Ms Mackay. Thanks, Presiding Officer, and I want to thank Stephen Kerr for bringing forward this debate to the Chamber as well. I'd also like to thank workers, the unions and the local community for their thoughts, opinions and concerns about the announcement and the future of the site. Having grown up in Grangemouth and having only managed a mile further up the hill, I know how important an issue this is to the entire area. I am angry on behalf of the workers and the community that the announcement was given weeks before Christmas. The bottom line, which, as we've already heard, has been questioned of this company, has been put before the workers and the impact on the community. And the timetable, as has been questioned across the chamber, seems arbitrary, to say the least. There is a lot of uncertainty and worry across the community, and I know there are local small businesses about, worried about what it means for them. We heard from the, the drop-in organised by Richard Leonard that workers who are parents are concerned about their job security and what that means for uprooting their families. And the ripples of this announcement reach far and wide in Grangemouth itself, as well as more widely across Falkirk. As we've already heard, there's been industry on that site for nearly 100 years, and I'm sure there will be industry on the site long after any of us in this chamber are still here. And the conversation I believe we need to be having now, as well as how we continue jobs there for the short term, is what that industry that for the future is, what it looks like, how we get there, and what it means for workers and those who live close to the refinery. To do all of that, we need to save the jobs and we need government support in that. It is clear that we, if we leave a just transition to the companies involved, it just won't happen. We need certainty and quickly to stop potentially highly skilled people from leaving their jobs. We need time for these dedicated and skilled workers to be able to transfer or change their skills to whatever comes next. And we need meaningful engagement with the community as to what they would like to see on their doorstep, which hasn't happened over the site so far. Unions want to engage with Petro Enios and the government to explore the reasoning behind the company's decision and what can be done to support workers. And if everybody hasn't already, I would encourage them to re read the briefing from Unite that came in earlier this afternoon. I also believe that the owners of Petro Enios and Petro China, if they haven't already, should come to the site to speak to workers and explain their decision. I believe we need to see a just transition which is what the workers want to see in their briefing this morning. The site moving to industries that are better for both people and planet, that are well paid and have good terms and conditions. I'm very aware there are a range of opinions across the chamber as to what form that next step takes. But I hope that for the community and the workers watching today, that they know that their representatives, including myself, are not taking this lying down, that we are committed to saving their jobs and providing a bright future for Grangemouth going forward. Thank you, Ms Mackay. I now call Stephanie Callaghan to be followed by Richard Leonard. Ms Callaghan. President Officer, I am grateful too to Stephen Kerr for securing today's debate in the future of Grangemouth Oil Refinery. And I agree with him that Grangemouth is indeed a jewel in Scotland's crown. Since its establishment in 1924, Grangemouth Refinery has been a steadfast pillar in Scotland's energy landscape, been the main supplier of fuel to Scottish airports and Scottish petrol stations, and importantly has provided a foundation to generations of families from the Falkirk area and beyond who have worked there since its establishment. However, today we are here to debate a new reality, the potential closure of the oil refinery a decision driven by economic realities such as growing international competition and environmental considerations that do carry weighty implications. And I want to say a little about learning from the past. The impact of Margaret Thatcher's deindustrialisation in my Uddingston Bales Hill constituency remains profound. Once thriving with coal mines and steelworks, Lanarkshire underwent a tragic transformation 
with mass unemployment that plunged communities into persistent poverty that still impacts them today. Communities were stripped of their identities and stripped of hope, with scars that generations will never forget nor forgive. Considering Grangemouth, a town already burdened with high levels of social deprivation, the potential closure threatens to exacerbate existing struggles, as we have heard. Simply put, we cannot afford to repeat the mistakes of the past. Grangemouth needs and deserves a just transition. While Petro Ennius' decision was driven by commercial factors, we must not overlook the profound concerns regarding the workforce and the regional economy. The Fraser of Alander Institute have projected a GDP reduction of approximately 0.25 to 0.3 per cent for the Scottish economy, an announcement deemed both significant and worrying. Furthermore, any jobs lost are not mere numbers. They represent families' livelihoods, and there will undoubtedly be ripple effects, as we've heard across the wider community. Yes. Stephen Kerr. I wanted to ask Stephanie Callan if she agreed that it's very important that we get a proper, quantifiable understanding of the impact that the closure of the refinery would have, because that will help scale what government can do and what government thinks it can afford in terms of any intervention that might extend the life of the refinery or give us the opportunity of a bridge to the just transitions he's talking about. Stephanie Callan. Presiding officer, I would certainly agree with that. When any decision impacts the livelihood of communities, it is imperative that the Scottish Government step up and facilitate a just transition at pace. And this means the provision of high-quality jobs, enhancing the community's prosperity and the safeguarding of the community's well-being being rightfully placed at the forefront. A just transition also brings the opportunity to chart a new course towards a fairer, greener future for all. And given its history as an industrial hub, Grangemouth is uniquely positioned to emerge as a centre of green innovation. Certainly. Michelle Thompson. I am very appreciative of, of giving her away. I, I, uh, I think that the situation we now find, if we carry on working in this very collaborative way, which I am personally very heartened about, and I agree with both governments and I agree about impact assessment, it can actually frame out an opportunity because we have known for some time that the complexities around putting meat in the bones of a just transition are considerable. Does she agree with that? Stephanie Callaghan. Absolutely. I would agree with my colleague Michelle Thompson on that one there. I think we all would, to be fair. Um, and I'm moving on to that anyway. It's, it's really good to see the Scottish Government's commitment to collaborating with operators throughout the Grangemouth cluster um, to spearhead new low-carbon initiatives, including carbon capture, utilisation and storage, hydrogen production and biorefining. Because everything possible must be done to create the right circumstances for Grangemouth to evolve into a flagship for sustainable energy production, and one that bolsters Scotland's ambition to achieve net zero emissions by 2045. However, President Officer, to ensure these future low carbon opportunities are realised with equity and fairness at its heart for the people who live and work there, continued collaboration is going to be paramount. The Scottish Government must continue working with industry, workers and communities to combine shared economic, social and environmental objectives. And like others today, I would also urge the UK Government to continue collaborating on a truly optimal future and meaningful prospects for Grangemouth. And while the establishment of the Grangemouth Future Industries Board marks a promising start, the UK Government must, as we have heard, focus on lifting the UK-wide barriers to sustainable aviation fuel. In closing, President Officer, we must secure Grangemouth's future from a financial, environmental and a social perspective. And through a just transition that embraces innovation, sustainability and compassion, we can shape a positive tra trajectory, one that recognises Grangemouth as a valuable asset that can propel the Scottish economy forwards towards a cleaner, more resilient tomorrow. Listening, collaborating and meaningfully engaging with affected communities, workers and industry will be key. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Callaghan. I now call Richard Leonard to be followed by Ash Regan. Mr Leonard. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank Stephen Kerr for bringing this debate to Parliament? And can I remind uh, members of my register of interests? Two weeks ago today, the First Minister, I thought, unfortunately, laid the foundations for a blame game. Grangemouth's hard workers and the wider community cannot be left at the mercy of UK government inaction, he opined. The key powers lie regrettably at Westminster. 
Well, of course, I will stand second to no one in demanding that the conditions are created for a sustainable aviation fuel policy for the UK and one that will generate jobs in Grangemouth. But the message which I bring from that wider community, from those hard workers, is that they do not want to be a political football between two opposing governments or indeed between government and opposition. At this time, in their hour of need, when we are... Yeah, I'll take an intervention. Uh, Minister. Thank you very much. I hope Richard Leonard has said what I said in response to Stephen Kerr very early doors in this uh, debate in that regard. Richard Leonard. Uh, yes, I do, and I very much welcome that, uh, uh, that commitment that's been given. Uh, but I did think it was worthwhile reflecting on the position of her boss. Um, we are at a time when the workers are in their hour of need uh, and when we are deciding on our future energy requirements. So they want both governments and all parties to be on their side, working together for the common good. They want an extension to the operation of the refinery. They want the hydro cracker restarted. They want investment and jobs. They want transition and protection. They want ambition and hope. Petro Ineos themselves say nothing changes until spring 2025. So there is still time for the government to commit to supporting a programme to extend the refinery's operation and to invest in new technologies such as biofuels and sustainable aviation fuel at the site. In my discussions with the refinery workers, it has not gone unnoticed that the Cabinet Secretary has variously called Grangemouth, and let me quote him exactly, an ageing site. To emphasise the point, the refinery is more than 100 years old, he has told us, as if we are dealing with a dilapidated, decrepit, obsolete, antique technology that hasn't had a penny spent on it for over a century. The closure of the refinery and the opening of an import terminal was, he said, in any case, a commercial decision which will future-proof the site as though we were dealing with a world based on rational decisions. But we are not. The Grangemouth refinery is not uneconomic. It is not making a loss, it is making a profit. And so I say in plain terms to the Minister that it is a strategic national asset. These are strategically important manufacturing jobs. This is a strategic national energy supply and its future should not be determined by offshore billionaires or overseas governments. This is Scotland's only refinery. It is linked to the Fortis pipeline. We should be refining and manufacturing our energy, not simply importing it. Because never in economic history has there been an import-led economic recovery. So let us finally see from this government an industrial strategy, which is jobs first, people-centred, manufacturing-led, environmentally sustainable. And if that means a stake taken out in this enterprise by the government, then that is what should happen. These workers need not just words, but action. They need political leadership. They need an economic strategy. And they are looking to this parliament and to this government to provide it. Thank you, Mr Leonard. Before I call the next speaker, I would advise that due to the number of members who wish to speak in the debate, I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. I now invite Stephen Kerr to move a motion without notice. Moved. Uh, thank you, Mr Kerr. The question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. I now call Ash Reagan to be followed by Monica Lennon. Ms Reagan. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to commend uh, Mr Kerr for securing this debate and for what was a very thoughtful contribution of his uh, this afternoon. Grangemouth, of course, is a strategic national asset for Scotland, and decisions regarding it need to be taken in that light. Crude oil is refined not only for fuel, but also for feedstock chemicals that are used right across our economy. Scotland, of course, produces 90% of UK oil and gas and has just one refinery. And to contextualise just how profitable 
the oil and gas produced in Scotland is to the UK, last year saw a record £10.6 billion in revenue flowing from Scotland to the UK Treasury. When I had the opportunity to question the UK Energy Minister Graham Stewart on this uh, just a couple of weeks ago, he admitted that the revenue from Scotland's oil industry is funding reductions in energy bills for the whole of the UK. I wonder if other members were surprised to hear from him, as I was uh, several weeks ago, that up until that point, the UK government, he reported, had had no approaches from anyone seeking funding for a rescue package. Now, £10.6 billion a year as an industry is hugely valuable, of course, to the UK economy, a country, a state rather, of 67 million people. And if we imagine just for a moment how much further that would go and what we could do with it in a country of just 5 million people. So Grangemouth needs investment to save it and to make it profitable into the future. And it's estimated that the investment that is needed is around about the £80 million mark. Now, £80 million is but a drop in the North Sea compared to the billions upon billions that Scotland's oil and gas industry has poured into the UK Treasury. £80 million is, in fact, only 0.7% of last year's revenue, not even 1% of a year's revenue. Now, Scotland only has one refinery. The rest of the UK has six, but it is the Scottish one that is marked for closure. And if Grangemouth is to be no more, Scotland will find itself in the very uncomfortable position of being the only top 25 oil producer globally with no refinery, the only one this is a disgrace. I'll give way. Minister. Would she agree with me that by using language like Grangemouth no more, however, it completely ignores the fact that Grangemouth and the refinery has a great deal of potential, if we get this right, may invest some of that oil and gas revenue into its just transition to perhaps a buyer refinery? Ash Regan. I don't completely agree with that, no. My um, imagining of a just transition, the just part is about the people. Um, in the future that the government is imagining, um, the people with the skills will largely be lost to the site if it is turned into some kind of import terminal. And also, Scotland needs to have a refinery once it's independent. We must continue to have a refinery. We must refine our own oil in it, not produce it and send it away and then buy it back at a premium. And of course, this is also an energy security issue. Reliance on global markets creates insecurity for Scotland, which is simply absurd for an energy-rich nation. And this is not an issue for the government, any government, to sit there and shrug their shoulders and just say, oh, well, there's nothing we can do. The Scottish people expect more, and they expect better. Uh, the UK government and the Scottish government must find some vision and some ambition and work together to secure a rescue plan. The UK government must provide the funding and the Scottish government must wake up and find a backbone. Anything less than this will be a betrayal of the workforce and the country. And we cannot stand by and see more of Scotland's key assets lost. History tells us once they are gone, they are gone forever. We can't stand by and see a key strategic asset lost to us forever. Thank you, Ms Regan. And I now call Monica Lennon, who will be the last speaker before I ask the Minister to respond to the debate. Ms Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I refer to my register of interest as a member of Unite the Union, the GMB and other trade union activities. And can I join colleagues in thanking Stephen Kerr for securing this important debate time today? But I do echo my Scottish Labour colleague, Daniel Johnson, who's right when he says that the Scottish Government needs to devote some of its time to bring a fuller debate to the Chamber, because that allows a fuller debate and more parliamentary scrutiny. But I was about to mention the Minister, but I'll take the... Minister. Yeah. ...need that opportunity next week when the Cabinet Secretary is delivering a statement. Um, 
I say that it's up to the Bureau to decide whether or not that's extended. And of course, you all have people who go along to Bureau. And, and could I also just say that we're in recess next week? Monica. <laughs> <laughs> I will be guided by you, as always, Deputy <laughs> Presiding Officer. Um, what I do welcome from the Minister is that commitment that she gave to Stephen Kerr at the, start of the, the very start of the debate, is that what workers and the people of Grangemouth, and indeed the people of Scotland, need is that collaboration between the Scottish Government and the UK Government, but all the, the key stakeholders. And before I go on to make a few other remarks, and I will be really brief, I think Stephanie Callaghan was really right to bring us back to what matters here. It is about people and their families. Mm. It is about livelihood. So we can get caught up in the big economic picture here, but this is about people and, and we need to hear their voices too. Um, I'm not a member of the Economy and Fair Work Committee, so I'll defer to colleagues who were part of the, the, the inquiry looking at just transition for Grangemouth. But I think it is important and significant that the committee did that, that piece of work. I think the report is, is very good and some things have been addressed. But I was concerned to read at the very top of the report. I was disappointed to learn that Enios turned down the committee's opportunity to give evidence. I'm not sure the reason for that, because that would have been a good opportunity to set out and get on the record what work that the company is doing to contribute to Scotland's net zero targets. Yes, of course. Michelle Thompson. I really appreciate it. Thank you. But uh, just to be completely accurate, it was Ineos that the committee approached rather than Petro Ineos. So just to make that uh, distinction. Ms Lennon. Okay, that's a that's, uh, useful um, clarification. But I think the report mentioned um, the Grangemouth Future Industry Board, which I understand has been recently repurposed. Um, I think Graeme Simpson's touched on this, but um, there was definitely questions in there about getting the right people around the table, including the potential role for the Scottish National Investment Bank and, again, you know, people from the community, including the workers and trade unions. So I know that um, recently the UK government has hailed the repurposing of the Future Industry Board as a, an opportunity for both governments to come together. Um, and hopefully that's the spirit, because I think, as we've heard today, this has largely been consensual and it's cross-party. And I think when Richard Leonard hosts a recent drop-in where we met with Unite Shop Stewards, they don't want politicking. You know, they want to hold politicians to account, but they want us to work together in the, the national interest. Um, I know that time is short and I've taken a couple of interventions. So I'll, I'll, I'll just conclude um, by saying that when we heard from Derek Thompson, the Scottish Secretary of Unite, he said that every option must be on the table. And I think as we try very, very hard to build a just transition for workers and communities, you know, we've really got to get our act together collectively. Every option must be on the table, but we need a planned approach. We've heard about the importance of an industrial strategy. That has been lacking. But today we've heard that commitment for joint working. Let's see what happens after recess. Thank you, Ms Lennon. And I now invite the Minister, Julian Martin, to respond to the debate. Minister. Yeah, I, just, I just nearly did us all out of uh, a week's recess there, and I, I do apologise. Um, in the spirit, in the spirit of, of, of Monica Lennon's contribution and her final words there, every option must be on the table possibly should be a, the, the phrase that we keep in mind as we go forward here. I want to thank Stephen Kerr not only for bringing this to the Chamber, but for the extremely constructive and collegiate speech that he gave and for his general attitude and also everyone, um, with, with the odd exception, who has carried on in that spirit. Because um, my colleagues, you're, you're, you're all right that the people of Grangemouth, in the wider Grangemouth area, the wider Falkirk area and the community are watching what we say in this. And we all have to put our shoulders to the wheel and look at every option. Now, I fully believe that although the, 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 the announcement <clears throat> has been obviously greatly worrying to the people who are currently working in the refinery, that we have everything to gain if we get this just done. This is a test for us. This is a test 
to make the first test of just transition if we can keep the refinery open in some shape or form. Um, I want to reflect on, before I sort of like go into maybe what, what um, we've been doing in government, I just want to reflect on some of the things that have been asked of me. Um, we need to look at the, the barriers of deployment for a biorefinery in particular. And coming to Mr Kerr's point about that, um, he will probably be aware, and if he's not, um, I can certainly send him details and I recommend that he gets in touch with colleagues at uh, Petronas about the, the regulatory barriers that they have identified to us that are there about becoming a biorefinery in terms of the HEFA cap. Now, the HEFA cap is, of course, the cap that has been put on the use of the crops that would provide feedstock for the biorefinery. Now, at the moment, um, the UK government have said that there is a cap on this, um, which, you know, is it's quite complex because it's about food security as well, about how much crops, how much uh, percentage of crops can be used for biorefinery. So, I want to reflect on what's been told to me by executives at uh, Petro Ineos in this regard. They have said that if the cap is lifted on HIFA, they could transition to a biorefinery very, very quickly. They are already doing um, appraisal, they're in the appraisal phase of the biorefining, bio but they have also said to me in the meetings that we've had that staff could be very quickly trained within, I think they said six months, but I could be wrong on that, but it was a very short period of time. I'll take an interview. Stephen Kerr. Very careful use of the word could, but would that be part of their intention? Would, is that part of their intention? Is it beyond words? Is it a would rather than a could? Minister. That's a question that's best put to them because they are making commercial decisions, but I very much got the sense that if that option was on the table and that the HIFA cap was looked at again by the UK government, Graeme Stewart was in that meeting as well. He said that it wasn't within his uh, uh, portfolio arrangement. Obviously, that goes into a wider agriculture portfolio. But certainly myself, the Cabinet, two Cabinet secretaries, both Mary Gouchon and um, uh, Neil Gray and myself, have written to follow up on that on behalf of Petro Ineos because that's what the workforce want as well. They are ready to go. That could, and that could secure the future for it. Um, the, just, I also want to mention about the economic impact assessment. Absolutely vital, but just as vital is the Just Transition, which is a, just transition Plan, which is action-focused and actually makes an assessment on the economic gains for the site and the wider community if we were to change to any of the options that are on the table as well. I think that's just about important. And I actually see that as being part of the Grangemouth Industry Forum uh, Board uh, remit. Daniel Johnson. I'm very grateful for the Minister for giving way. I, I wonder if those two points actually come together in an important way, and that actually it's, it's well and good talking about just transition and a need for a plan, but actually unless they draw in things like Haifa, uh, decision that she mentioned, but other decisions which may lie in other departments, then we don't really have a plan. It really needs to be joined up because, after all, there's an investment gap because peak oil was 20 years ago, but we only have 10% of our installed offshore wind generation capacity. Minister. It's a really important point by Daniel Johnson, and I was going to come on to that because that we also talked, and Graeme Simpson talked about this, about the market, the market for what they would actually be producing. Uh, particularly say, sustainable aviation fuels. And just a, a, a little word about what's happening in the government, got Scottish Government space around that. We have actually got a, a, a working group with Manny McAllen set up with the, the, the airports of Scotland. Um, and indeed, um, the Cabinet Secretary, Neil Gray, is actually uh, meeting with airlines and airports in Scotland as well about that market. But Grangemouth has the, the, the potential to be a leader in the UK in providing sustainable aviation fuel. And if you look at our climate change targets for both governments, what difference that that would actually make. And if the airlines and the airports are willing to sort of like put the set out their stall in actually saying, we will take on this product, then what difference would that make in terms of the sustainability of aviation in the future as well? I want to mention a couple of other people that have made a... Um, Gillian Mackay, uh, impact, she talked about the impact on the wider Grangemouth town's economy, and that was backed up by Stephanie Callaghan as well. Those lessons in history are absolutely important. The Chamber will know that I am a child of Clydebank, who suffered the same kind of... Uh, 
situation that uh, Stephanie Callan had. I will take Julian McKay. I thank the Minister very much for taking the intervention. The, the nature of the Grangemouth site is quite unique in how close it is to the town and, and where people live. Will she commit to involving the community as this is in some cases across a, a, a road and a grass verge from people's houses that she'll commit to involving the community in what the site looks like, what comes next and the impact on their living environment? Minister. I think that's a really important consideration. At the moment, the, the, the Grangemouth Future Industries Board has the unions involved, obviously has Petroenius involved, but it also has the council involved and community councils as well. So that's possibly the conduit, but if that can be widened out in some shape or form, I'm up for that. I also want to say in terms of the Grangemouth Future Industry Board, I, went, I was at the, the, the first meeting that we had, we had there, and we actually thought that um, we need to have more frequent meetings than we already outlined as well. And we also need to look at the scope of actually what we do and maybe even potentially have some subgroups uh, around that as well and also be action focused not a talking shop actually looking at the plans for the future and looking at how we lifting the barriers off that emerging technologies such as hydrogen production biofuels manufacturing could sustain that refinery it could provide jobs for the existing uh, workforce but also for the future workforce of Grangemouth and the wider area as well but business can't do this alone commercial decisions get made but I am so heartened on the tone of this debate about both governments working together we, um, we it's absolutely uh, my, my, myself and Graeme Stewart and John Lamont uh, were in that meeting and cabinet secretary Neil Gray off the back of that meeting um, myself and Neil Gray wrote to the UK government ministers involved to follow up on some of the assurances that they had given us that they want to be fully involved in the future of protecting the future of that refinery. Um, yes. Uh, Stephen Kerr. I'm very grateful for her patience and uh, allowing me to a second intervention. C before she concludes, can she comment on the issues raised about the hydro cracker? Um, because that seems to me to be a vital component in terms of extending the life of the refinery as it is. And then on the economic impact assessment that a number of us have spoken about, has the work on that begun? And does she have an estimation as to when that might be produced? Simply because I think it will give all of us a huge impetus to make sure that what we're talking about in relation to transition actually happens. And Minister, when responding, please start to talk about I, I will wind again. up, a bit, and I want to thank Stephen Kerr for reminding me I was going to come on to the hydro cracker. There is actually not much I can say because it is commercially sensitive. But we, knew, we do know that uh, the, the site operators are working at pace to get it back online as quickly as possible. And that's really all I can say in that at the moment. That's come, that's come from them themselves. It is absolutely fundamental. Um, and, and, and just at this point about the economic impact assessment, that has actually been done by, by, by the, the, the group itself. Obviously, we've got our officials involved in the assessment of the economic impact as well, Scottish Government uh, assessment. We've got Scottish Enterprise in, involved as well, as you, uh, as you would hope. Um, but I just want to say, uh, from, my, from my point of view, Everything that's possibly that's been done to actually look at how, what can we do as governments and agencies and the private sphere as well to realise the potential of this site that is ideally located geographically, has a long history of providing fuel and energy security for Scotland and has the most expert workforce who we cannot afford to let down for the reasons which all of you have said, uh, all, all of the members have said in this debate today, you have my assurance and the Cabinet Secretary's assurance that we in the Scottish Government will work with whoever has solutions to prolong the life of the refinery. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate and I suspend this meeting until 2pm. Thank you.